Institute at Melbourne, Ab Osterhaus, who is now professor in the University of Veterinary Medicine in Hanover, and Erika Olman Safir, professor at the Scripps Research Institute. So the idea is to have, again, an informal conversation on this. I suggest that maybe uh, Jim Leduc can introduce the topic with some thoughts, and then I would like to gather some thoughts from the contributors, and then, obviously, open discussions with all of you. So maybe, uh, Jim, you can start. Or we can stay here, it's up to you. It's your choice. You um, can stay here or be here. Then you can sit here and then it's just us. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, right. I'm not taking over, believe me. <laughs> well, thank you very much for that uh, introduction. Um, let me start with a, uh, a little history and, and, and a story. Um, we have been, the Galveston National Laboratory at the University of Texas is uh, just celebrated 10 years of operations. And uh, during that time, we in the United States and North America have met with the, the directors of uh, maximum containment laboratories, these BSL-4 laboratories, several times. We know each other, and it's kind of a small club. And we know the, the folks in Europe, both scientifically and as well. So I thought that uh, I knew what was going on in this small community. Uh, about a year ago, uh, I participated in a WHO meeting that was actually hosted uh, down the road in Lyon. Uh, at that time, the, uh, the, the coordinator said that there was over 50 BSO-4 laboratories either in operation or well under construction. And this was really surprising to me, frankly. And, uh, Clearly, there's substantial benefits, and we heard yesterday the wonderful opportunities that these BSO-4 laboratories, Erica and, and Bob, both gave real firm examples of how the expertise at different facilities uh, working on high hazard pathogens can then be validated with a real pathogen in these biocontainment labs. And having an, a, a wider network of these certainly makes, uh, makes sense in the context of drawing in the expertise literally from around the world. So there's lots and lots of benefits for it. There's also some concerns, and, and that <laughs> immediately went to my mind, how are we going to make sure that all of these new laboratories are using best practices? We heard also during the meeting that uh, four separate outbreaks of SARS occurred not naturally but in the laboratories, as laboratory-based uh, uh, infections. There are real risks there. The infrastructure challenges, you're all aware of the foot and mouth disease episode in the UK several years ago. I mean, there are potentially real significant problems when something goes wrong with these high hazard uh, laboratories. <coughs> so, uh, based on, on this, this discussion, I started uh, working with some other colleagues. And actually, historically, we've been working, we, the the U.S. National Academy of Sciences, <laughs> Diane uh, Griffin, and others, uh, we've been collaborating with a number of the laboratories in China uh, to, as they develop new BL4 laboratories. And they have three that are just about operational or, in fact, are operational. And so over the past uh, several years, we've been working with them, uh, just making sure that they, w we could offer any assistance that they demanded or, or requested. So we've had training and all. And one of the biggest areas of concern is the building operations. You know, these are highly complex facilities. Uh, it's not like you can go to engineering school and learn how to drive a BSL-4 laboratory. It's kind of on-the-job training. So having uh, the ability to contact one another and resolve questions is really important. We've also worked with a number of uh, uh, folks as they've considered building laboratories in their facilities. So we've had visitors from, from uh, not only China, but Korea, Japan, Australia, and all, just to kind of learn uh, what works and what doesn't work, because each of these labs is built on the mistakes of the ones before it. So anyway, all that to say that there's benefit of knowing this group. So the proposal then that I would make to the GVN is that perhaps we should try and identify under this global umbrella the, the, the population that really is most directly involved in these high containment laboratories. And in fact, we wrote an editorial that appeared in Science uh, last month 
really calling for this, a national network or global international network of uh, biocontainment lab directors. And, and I think that there's a real opportunity here to make sure that globally we're using the same best practices. A and as we heard, there's also an element of biosecurity that we need to pay attention to. If we don't, somebody else is going to tell us what to do. If collective we, collectively we can all say we're using these established best practices, then I think perhaps we will uh, uh, mitigate some of the, the regulatory burden that uh, may very well fall upon us. And believe me, we already have plenty of it, at least in the state. So I think with that, let me just stop there. Uh, thank you very much, and we will. Uh, I suggest that we have the, the three other contributors because there are obviously very different perspectives uh, this to, to this question, and then we can engage uh, the conversation. So maybe Sharon, you want to? Um, well, I think uh, uh, I think that's an excellent suggestion. Actually, we um, I had an institute in Melbourne that ho that hosted one of the first BL4 for human uh, diagnostics, and um, I know that the partnerships that were formed in the design of that were absolutely critical. Um, and uh, you, you mentioned around um, around around the regulations mm. of those. You know, we have the local regulators <laughs> definitely make sure we uh, keep to best practice. But I think some uh, some sort of international network would be great. Um, I, uh, I, I, I I she thought I'd just talk about um, what's happening in Australia on the biosecurity front with um, the establishment of a new network that was funded about two years ago, which is called a Prize, which is a long acronym for Australian Preparedness Network. And uh, our focus in that network is on four areas um, in uh, clinical, in the clinical arena, it's around pre-approved protocols, so if something should happen in Australia, we have pre-approved protocols for clinical trials, amongst other things in the clinical arm. Um, Big e emphasis on data sharing, even within Australia, we're limited in how we share data just by how our states and territories are divided, let alone data sharing internationally. Um, biobanking, again, that's a big, um, big, uh, an important area in the event of preparedness, and even within the Australia, we've got a lot of work to do. And a key focus on vulnerable populations, and I think from the previous um, talk, we heard that vulnerable populations actually do exist everywhere, um, and in Australia, particularly Indigenous populations. So we've been doing, and for example, H1N1, um, when H1N1 came, we had very high rates of mortality amongst our Indigenous populations. <coughs> so we're trying to do the groundwork locally for Indigenous populations. And finally, trying to get established connections with other similar networks that I know exist in Europe, in Asia, within countries, uh, France, for example, has a similar network reacting. So I think these are all um, things happening <coughs> in addition to GVN. So the question is sort of where does GVN fit in with that? Um, and I think some of the work around biobanking is key, some of the work around um, training, capacity building. Um, and, uh, you know, I, I think some mapping of those networks would really help because many governments are making serious investments. So we need to be thinking with GVN about that changing landscape <coughs> because it is changing quite significantly. Thank you very much. Ab? Yeah, basically I agree with most of what has been said. Uh, I, think, I think whether this is really going to be a task for GVN, it's a question mark for me because there's a lot of initiatives ongoing there. Yeah, so in different continents we have different initiatives. One of the main problems I see is also the basically the, uh, the criteria, the classification of the different agents, which is different in, in different places, but also the SOPs, the way, we the way in which we work. There's well, the, 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 the example of SARS was mentioned here, but after SARS was controlled, basically, we had outbreaks coming, coming from, from BSO4 labs. So, so basically, there, there is a need for standardization. There is a need for, for common practices and also uh, having the same criteria uh, being used. Uh, the, the other thing, of course, is, is what is a BSL-4 agent, what is a bs loop agent, when do you switch from 4 to 3, that is that only when there is a vaccine, so there's a number of criteria there, and WHO gives some guidelines, but it's not conclusive, I think, so there, there, is, a big <coughs> there is a big problem there. One of the, the things that, that really bother me in this particular area, we have, uh, and I, I alluded to that yesterday, 
We have been involved in the Devon Crusade, the group I have in Rotterdam. We have been involved heavily in this gain of function work, as it's being called. Yeah? So basically, uh, influenza virus, H5N1, making it a human transmissible virus. Yeah? So w who can do that? What are the criteria? And that's not clear to us at all. So what we did is basically we got the national permissions, everything. So we had a national group looking into it. We had the European permissions there. This was the European project. And it was together with a, an, an NIH project, so we we got we got uh, we got su surveillance every 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 year at least. Uh, the CDC team was coming along, and then basically when we wanted to publish the work, basically the idea was so it was the similar work was being done in the U.S. by Yoshika Roka's group and our two papers basically crossed the ocean. So we made the mistake by sending it to Science rather than Nature, and and Yoshi sent it to Nature. And then the interesting thing is that I learned at that time, I didn't know that, but we were subject to the non-proliferation treaty, and that means if you would have sent it to nature, yeah, which which was English, and at that time it still was still European, yeah. So 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 so, so, <laughs> so, so basically we were we, we we would not have been in trouble. And then actually we were being threatened by uh, with jail sentences by our Minister of Health, etc. And then NSADB got involved, as you know, yeah, so for science we needed an approval from NSADB. Yeah, and then and then basically our, our Dutch authorities said, what the heck are the Americans doing here? We have our own responsibility. So th there's all these kind of national, international uh, things that that need to need to be considered. But also during the meeting here, yeah. So now, for instance, I was alluding yesterday to some measles work we are doing. Right. If I want to do the measles work, we want to do on the receptors, the adaptation of the the animal mobility viruses to humans, for instance, which I think is a major thing. So that is considered to be gain of function. Yeah? Whatever you do there, and if you if you extrapolate that, all the work we do, which we are doing today is gain of function. They're gain or loss of function. So there is an there is an enormous gray area. And if you look in in Germany, that it, it becomes very difficult there. Yeah, because because there that's a country where where basically all the the things are going strictly to the rule as they should. Yeah, but it is very difficult to get approvals, etc. So most of the work we are planning to do is actually being paralyzed at the moment because you don't even so we, we started working on mobility viruses of aquatic mammals because nobody thinks you can do anything bad with those mobility viruses but basically we wanted to do that with with, with primates of course so so uh, what i think is on the one hand we have to be sure that these kind of experiments are not being carried out by people who cannot do no, do it they haven't got the proper safety so we need we need rules there but we, we need rules that that do not paralyze the science so I think one of the issues we're discussing here today is biosecurity, and I completely ag agree. But but basically, uh, people who who really want to commit bio bioterrorism proper, yeah, they don't need a DSL four lab. Yeah, they, you, you can do that anywhere. If people are prepared to fly into twin towers, yeah, to prepare them for this. Then it's not difficult to do the same for for bioterrorism. So I think there is an, a, a very gray area there. I don't know if there's a role for for GVM there. I'm, I'm not sure. I think it's. It's a very big problem, but at least the GVM community they could they could get involved in the discussion. So this the, the last issue I mentioned, really this gain of function issue, is something that bothers me tremendously because a lot of the experiments we should be doing, we want to be doing to be better prepared for new viruses emerging. So if you get a new virus, let's say a new MERS like virus or whatever, immediately we run into these problems because then you need to go for your per your permits, etc. And it takes you a year before you can act. So that is the point I would like to bring. What the function of, of, of this group here, the GVN, we are an international a global community, and I think we might play a role. But if we do it, we have to do it very seriously and involve all the, all the other initiatives as well. Yeah, thank you. Yeah. From the basic research perspective of needing to find molecules or vaccines to move from the laboratory toward the bedside, I wanted to add a note of sort of enthusiasm and optimism for some of the modern methods coming out now that weren't previously available. The ability to use rapid real-time genomics methods to track evolution of the virus, which gives you information about how it is tracked, how it is moved from species, or the multiple spillovers, how you could then go back and contain. The diversity of antigens that you might use or need to employ in your diagnostics and in your vaccines. Rapid broad antibody discovery methods that help you find those needle in the haystack methods that needle in the haystack antibodies that you could use with therapeutics or to probe vaccine activity that were too difficult or too slow to find before. Structural methods that tell you what the right form was. There's a beautiful talk on 
um, RSV, where it shows if you don't have the right structure, you're not going to have the right response. And if you don't have that image of that structure, then you are blind in trying to understand how your vaccine might work. So all these new methods that we've had just from the, the explosion of them in the last five or ten years, I think are going to enhance our ability to, to an anticipate, defend, and provide tangible solutions against these viruses, real solutions instead of band-aids. I'm very much a proponent of the roots, not parachutes concept, because I've seen firsthand that this works very well. That when you have scientists and ecologists and epidemiologists and survivors and healthcare workers and community leaders all on the same page with their complementary sources of information and sources of data and resources and tools, you can get much further faster. So the people we, so for example, with Lhasa, we only got the structures because we had access to the antibodies. We only had access to the antibodies because there's a cohort of human <coughs> survivors willing to offer those cells and a cohort of healthcare workers that knew who they were and community workers able to track these populations and teams of ecologists and epidemiologists trying to understand that information. And we only had that entire network of genomics to healthcare to community involvement to every kind of science because Bob Gary built that facility and put all invited all of those different people from whatever it was they were working on to come and work in the same place and interact with each other. And by taking your, your computational genomic scientists and your structural biologists and dropping them in the same house or in the same tent with people that have been tracking rodent populations for years, you start to learn, well, how can you do something more useful? That you might ask, well, what, you know, what good is a cryo-EM expert in, in Kenema? Well, the answer is that it inspires them to try the 999th iteration of something that's going to get the answer because they've been able to work with the people firsthand and see what's needed. And while they're busy designing antigens that they need for their structures, those same antigens are also becoming diagnostics and vaccines. So by integrating multidisciplinary groups that have complementary tools and freely sharing information and resources among them, and working very closely with po you know, populations and survivors and healthcare workers that see what's happening and track um, movements of the virus and different things, we can get answers further and faster and uh, tangible tools to solve problems to which we didn't have access a decade ago. Thank you. Thank you very much. So I guess now we can open the, uh, the, z the discussion. <coughs> Clearly we see that from these first uh, talks is that we have a general question about virus security with a different way to, 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 to view the, the question. And we have the specific question on can the GVN provide something and if yes, how? And just to, to, to initiate, and this is an obvious point, but from what you said, the, the four of you, clearly we need expertise, we need skills. It always comes to the way we educate, we train uh, in the different countries. Um, and obviously we have many other institutions which are involved in training and education, but it is clear that regarding what is required uh, to really deal with all these challenges that you have uh, tackled, um, I personally believe that the GVN has a lot to offer, but uh, as you said, the four of you, uh, as always, really taking into account the, the existing, and this is why we really need to, 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 to have this uh, in mind. <coughs> so maybe we have now some uh, opinions. Why are you here? Why did you speak? you and that uh, currently all the models are inefficient, whether through a better coordination of <coughs> virologists, bioinformaticians and so, we could improve the predictive value of this uh, modelization approach. And, and so I was wondering whether the GVN could have a role in 
perhaps improving coordination between the various initiatives that are implemented worldwide. Thank you, maybe you can take this part. Well, GDN can certainly provide networks to introduce you to scientists that you might need that have that expertise. Not everybody can whip up a logistic regression or you know, an artificial intelligence model. Um, we have done some of that collaborating, for example, with Christian Anderson and Galit Alter. And if something was a really clear, strong correlation, the human eye figured it out too. It seemed to have somehow more believable to reviewers if a computer put a number on it. Mm -hmm. But having those tools can be helpful in finding small correlations. And, and the, the key thing is going to be getting access to people that know how to interpret and use <laughs> that information well. Perhaps, perhaps I may add, though. So when, when we're talking about modeling in general, I think being prepared for, for future outbreaks, uh, it's quite important to early on involve the modelers. And so we have done that with the people from Cambridge and other places. And, and, and we have made very nice models there for, for outbreak management, what we're going to have, what are the most, the most, uh, most efficacious ways of intervention in certain outbreaks. For instance, we were preparing uh, quite efficiently, I think, for an HIV sorry, an, an H5 outbreak break starting, starting in, uh, in Thailand, for instance. And perhaps we were doing all the work that we did in London. And then, as a matter of fact, when H1N1 came from Mexico, so we, we, we were completely <laughs> unprepared. Yeah. So I think, I think the point is that, that you can learn a lot from these kind of models. Yeah, what intervention uh, strategies are going to do, whether you should vaccinate antivirals, diagnostics, all these different elements. And I completely agree with you when you talk about this teamwork. Yeah, because where are you really going to put most of your efforts? But I think on the other hand, yeah, whilst we need those guys, <coughs> we no need those insights, I think it's very important to be modest yeah, and not to overemphasize their value because, because every new preparing for those kind of situations is difficult. But as soon as you have a new outbreak and then collecting all the parameters with the epidemiology, with the clinicians, with all these people you have to work with, you can, you can, ha you can have your models ready and plug the data in, and then see what's the most, what would be the most most effi uh, effective intervention strategy, and that's that's happening. Yeah. But from what I understand, I think that the key issue for all these uh, uh, new uh, uh, algorithm is the, the the mass of high quality data to uh, validate them, and so uh, and I think it's important both for predictive models but also for models that could allow actually the efficacy to assess the efficacy of intervention, local interventions. And so typically the only way to get this mass of high quality data is only through international cooperation. And then also when you have an outbreak, what, what we saw with SARS for instance, I remember that, that by the time we started to collect the relevant data for the, for the models and for the epidemiology to take place, yeah, the, the, the outbreak was over. Yeah, so we have to be prepared. If we get a new outbreak, we have to make sure that at least the clinical data are being collected. Yeah, at least we know something about incubation time, transmissibility, R0, all these kind of things. And early on in an outbreak, it's, it's of essential importance to get those data together. Yeah, and, and, and that is, and, and normally, what well not normally, in the past what happened quite often is that people started to collect those data yeah, too late and then the, the, the models were lacking at that time. Thank you. Ponceno. <laughs> yes, thank you very much. By coincidence, when I woke up this morning, I was thinking of setting up a BSL-4 club. <laughs> <laughs> so it, it was such, and I was discussing with a colleague at breakfast, but why don't we set up this lab? But such a coincidence. I agree that for now, the key thing is to have quick diagnosis to control some of these outbreaks. And we are very happy that many labs are getting the facilities to, uh, to, to diagnose. Uh, simple using uh, PCR and the rest, which has really shortened our responses to outbreaks. Very, very important. But the reason I was thinking about the BSL-4 lab <coughs> is exactly what my colleague from uh, uh, Zambia was talking about. You have a new outbreak, a suspected new virus, but you don't have all the facilities. It is good you can send to a neighbor or other countries so that you can identify new pathogens. But I think what is bothering us in developing countries is ownership mm. and uh, uh, intellectual property and the rest. I think the arguments, the memorandums, the funding sometimes are a little bit not even. Yeah? 
You find if I send my specimen to a lab somewhere, I start losing ownership, intellectual property, and all that. If you ask me, I come from Uganda Virus Art Institute. So many viruses have been isolated. Where is ownership for UVRI in Uganda? None. Yeah? You start owning. I think what we need to do very carefully is if we are sending specimens anywhere else to work on this ownership, intellectual property, because these are sensitive even with our government, with our scientists, and that may be a motivation to push people to say, let's do everything here and minimize shipment of specimens. I know the dangers of setting up so many of these labs. By safety is very important. We have clearly indicated viruses that have been spread because of poor by safety measures. But I think this ownership, intellectual property, who owns this is very, very troublesome and bothers us. That's why some of us are pushing to do more and more locally. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, please. Yeah, um, I think that's a, a really excellent point, Montiano. And uh, Erica mentioned it before with the roots, not parachutes, line, which I, I hadn't heard before. And um, I think it really does take um, a lot more thought and discussion about how to do that really well. And um, putting infrastructure like a um, BL4 into many countries um, is enormous expense. <coughs> and I'm not sure that's the so – I think – I really think it's a big issue and I think it's something that perhaps we could have a lot more discussion and some high-level principles or an approach to, to that. Uh, um, but I think putting the infrastructure in locally will be really – you know, I'm not even sure it's feasible given the cost. I just, again, just saying we've got the only BL4 in Australia um, and the costs are enormous and even making sure that we're using it all the time is um, is a big pressure on us and that's in a, in a, in a high income country. So. Could, we, could we ask Noel Tordeau to comment there because he has some experience there in Guinea. He's building up a laboratory and, and just for the practical issues. The, quest the question was, why shouldn't we have BSL-4s all over the place in Africa yeah, just for the, for, the, for the sake of ownership? Wha what's your opinion there? You, you're running this, this new setting in, uh, in, in Guinea. Yeah, I'm not running a BSL-4 here. I'm not planning well, to I know, but, but I'm not you planning to, be to, be a, to, to, to do BSL-4. We, we had a discussion uh, in Guinea because you know that after Ebola, uh, a certain number of samples stayed. M many of them left uh, without MPA frequently, MPA frequently, and it was uh, you, you know that it was a question which was which was present in in Liberia, in Sierra Leone, and in Guinea uh, about the ownership. And this is exactly what has been said before me uh, by by our friend from from Uganda. It was a big question here. Uh, and so behind that was, uh, is it possible to have, I'm not talking about the BSL-4, but only to have biobanks here. Biobanks, I mean, uh, samples that are kept safely. That could come, for example, for, for it could be a positive sample of Ebola that you are keeping safely. And we have a lot of discussions with American in particular, and particularly with DETRA, so the fact that things should not be uh, spread out, and I share your opinion, uh, uh, Ab, that uh, I, know, I, I don't think that it is a main way for terrorism to do that. It's more, I mean, Ebola is coming from, from the fields, indeed, in those countries. It's not a country uh, coming from, from out. And uh, we had a discussion, and we had two different opinions. People from CDC, for example, and, and with the uh, American ambassador there, wanted us to send all the samples that we have, which is a very limited number of them. This is the end of the epidemic. Most of them already flew to US, to France, to, to different places. And Fricia, you can, you can agree that even when the Masanta sample left to Lyon, I said, is it possible to keep at least a copy in Guinea uh, in order to be more rapid the last time, the next time it will be an Ebola crisis here, and I hope it will never, but, but it can happen. And you refuse at that moment because really we were in the real uh, beginning. So we had this discussion and the American was proposing you send all your samples in the US, we are inactivating them and we send them back. And with these samples that are, that are killed, let's say you can do the same diagnosis and with the other. And for someone having a bit of knowledge about science, you cannot do the same thing. 
in America, in, in, in Guinea, for example, uh, I said that yesterday, there is a predict, uh, predict program mm -hmm. which is trying to, to find if there is an Ebola virus circulating in bats, for example. I advise them to inactivate by uh, the, the, the samples before, before testing. So you cannot do exactly the same thing. And even for detection, you cannot do exactly the same thing. So what, what I'm personally defending is to learn to, to make safe biobanks. And we, we had, for example, a, a secure door in our biobank and to learn the Guinean people how to manipulate safely the samples. And we will not grow virus, of course. We will not grow BSL-4 viruses. But we can, get, we can do an inactivation one day it will be necessary to do. Or we can help you, Alb. You are defining a new Ebola test or Erika is defining a new Ebola test for anything, and yeah, you are missing some Ebola sample in order to check them. So this could be interesting to be to I in this uh, mm. situation. Mm. So a safe, a safe use of it um, after yeah, the laboratories, the laboratories, the BSL-4 certainly not, BSL-3, but I, I agree that if you accept to make a BSL-3, and we will do a BSL-3 in Guinea, you have to accept the cost. Mm. So you have to make something which is not really done in Africa up to now, the countries that I know, meaning a business plan mm -hmm. in order to be certain that you will be able to maintain it for a long time. That's it. Thank you. We have Jean-Marc Hero. Uh, yes, I, I actually work in Madagascar. <coughs> uh, of course, I think in Africa for building BSL, BSL4 is unrealistic uh, for different uh, issues, problem of cost, maintenance, uh, uh, and uh, the capacity uh, of technical capacity. But I would be more concerned about the, the, the there is a lot, a lot of a lot of BSL three BSL three labs, and that in countries that where uh, some emerging hemorrhagic mm -hmm. viruses are circulating. So the 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 issue that we may encounter is the the lack of standardization uh, of protocol, as you mentioned, uh, and it, it's really a nightmare when you start to to build uh, some uh, uh, SOPs. Uh, do you have to follow the uh, the <coughs> regulation, U.S. regulation, European, French? I even in Europe, there is different regulations, so it's really difficult. And maybe the GVN could help and help also on the, uh, as Professor Ostros mentioned, the re redefinition of the um, um, the BSL three pathogen, BSL four pathogens, based on the risk assessment of the virus, not only uh, on uh, on the uh, vaccine or availability. That's f the first point. And the second point also for, for, for working in the field and, and facing several outbreaks that we were never able to, uh, to identify the uh, etiologic agent is a lack of uh, uh, point of care testing. But now with this new technology like the Minion system, uh, we could eventually uh, build some capacity and GVN may help on that to build internal capacity uh, to deploy very easily uh, at the country level some, some team that can uh, try to collect specimen and, and quickly identify. Because when we arrive, it's, it's really it's the hand generally of the outbreak and we are not able to identify. Thank you, Abel. I would like to come back to the question from our, our, our colleague mm -hmm. from Uganda about ownership. I think that's a very important thing. And, and I can give you two examples. Uh, so the first example was when we were collaborating with, with a, a group of a dozen labs on SARS. So we, we, under the guidance of WHO, we decided to actually do a patent pool, make a patent pool where all of us could participate. The idea being that if you want to make a vaccine, which we didn't need in the end, but we didn't know that, yeah, or you want, or you want to make, an, an, uh, uh, let's say, antivirals, or you want to do uh, diagnostic assays, you want to commercialize them, Companies are not interested if they are not being protected in any way, usually. So we, we, we published that in the bulletin of the WHO as a standard procedure. When, when MERS came, yeah, and then, so, so basically, we, the first author of the New England paper was somebody from Saudi Arabia, yeah, so he initiated that. So I think ownership there, at least as far as, far as publication rights are concerned, that was, I think that was, that was fair. And then, but then we, we, we patented, we wanted to patent yeah, the, uh, basically the, the sequences <laughs> of the virus. It was a new virus. And basically we, we contacted WHO again to do, in principle, the same thing as we did for, for SARS. 
and then there was it was quite fuzzy. And then uh, at the end of the day, we decided to to patent anyway, yeah, and to offer the Saudis and other people involved, yeah, the access and the rights to the patent. And then afterwards, we were we were heavily criticized by having patented this thing, yeah, because because you don't patent viruses, and even even uh, well, the um, well basically the, the people from WHO were even were even were even criticizing us that we had patented the sequences. Well, I think I think we have to we have to agree on this kind of issue. I fully agree with you. Taking the samples, running away, yeah, patenting it and making money out of that, even if it's for your lab, is wrong. Yeah, but if you share it properly and you allow at least investment by industry, yeah, to make vaccines, antivirals, uh, diagnostics, I think that's an important thing, and we should agree on that as well. How to do that? And we thought we had agreed upon it after the the SARS outbreak, and when MERS came. Yeah, so we, we were we were facing a wall basically, and that had to do with political issues, between the uh, relationship between WHO and, and, and Saudi Arabia. So there were a lot of difficult things. But I think it's important that we get uh, rules established for these kind of things. How do you do that? What's good practices there? Because if you don't patent, you will be criticized. If you patent, you will also be criticized because yeah. you you're losing an opportunity. And no, thank you. And all of these are very important points. So, G Jim, how do you re react to this, um, and also to the both the intellectual property, and also I would like maybe to come back to the BSL three, yeah, sure. because this has been also my experience as president of the <laughs> institute <laughs> as well. <laughs> well, let me first go back to the colleague from Uganda and asking the question: If I had a BSL four laboratory, what am I going to do with it? Why do I want to build it? Because I think this is the critical question that has to be asked before people start investing. And so often uh, a donor might say, well, let's, let's build <laughs> this, we'll give you the money. Well, that's nice and nobody wants to say no to money coming in. On the other hand, the sustainability question is enormous <coughs> and you really need to understand what you're going to do with that facility before you, before you build it. The question of should we engage BSL-3 laboratories. I think this is very appropriate, but I tell you, even in the United States where we monitor all these things, we don't know how many BSL-3 laboratories there are. And it really is a massive problem. I, my, <laughs> my simplistic approach is let's start small, see if we can at least make a listserv of everybody so that we know who's, who's where and who's doing what and uh, try to, uh, to move forward building on, on a foundation of those that are involved. I, I agree completely that many of the BSL-3 laboratories uh, share the same problems, especially those higher end ones like ABS and, and others that are very sophisticated, um, but it, it becomes where do you draw the line? And my approach would be to draw it at, at the four for now. The question was raised, what's a BSL-4 pathogen in one country and not in another, and, and that's a, a source for discussion. But I think really the, the primary goal is just to identify the player. Then you can have these discussions, what, whether it's on ownership or what we classify things or what the best SLT is. But right now, we don't even have points of contact for all these facilities that exist. And so I think that's the, the starting point. Thank you. And so do you believe that there are already existing institutions which are trying to do that, or do you believe that we can be of help? Uh, for example, let's, it's very simple-minded, but let's imagine that we have about, uh, about 45 centers in the GDM, okay? So let's imagine that we ask to everybody, which are the BSL-3 you are aware of, and can in the education and training program that we have again, can we, for example, intervene? for skills, expertise, trainings, or is it something which is already being done by others, in your view? So the training, biosafety training, in many respects, become a cottage industry. There's a lot of people that are going around <laughs> offering training for a price and uh, it may or may not be, be useful. Um, I'm not sure that we have we, we can play a role in that by identifying past experiences and helping to facilitate contact between those that need training and those that are offering training. I'm not sure that we want to take on 
the training mission ourselves, and thus that's already part of that. Question. <laughs> no, it, it does answer. I mean, we want anything but uh, initiating uh, things which yeah. are not useful. I right. mean, we have so much on our plate, so, so exactly. that's... Uh, yeah, l let me just make one other point. Yeah. Uh, Ab had mentioned that there are existing networks, and that's absolutely true. I don't think that we should be reinventing the wheel. What we do need to do is to find uh, those that are already players in this field and incorporate them. I'm not suggesting that we take over anything. I, I do think that we need to coordinate what's already in place and, and uh, do a little better uh, communications between the two. Thank you. <coughs> oh, yeah, sure. I've got no, a, a, a quick question for Jim, because uh, within GBN, what percentage of the 40 BL4s would be in GBN? Do you think you would say? I don't know. It's a minority, I yeah. think. But yeah. Do we have a question? Howie Gendelman from Nebraska. I, this is my first time here and uh, having attended many meetings, uh, also uh, quite international, I found a, a couple things that were really unique, but in need, in, in need for cohesion. And what, what I've, I've experienced personally here is diversity, diversity of approach, diversity of disease, uh, and the depth from the epidemiology, natural history, molecular biology, even pharmacology and development, and even the social aspects of disease and the predictive components were really on target. We have incredible resources here, broader than any organization that I've ever seen uh, at a biomedical uh, research meeting. So th the question that I'm struggling with is how do we put the pieces together and how do we sell it so we can actually have an impact other than just another exchange that we do all the time? So perhaps if I may, may, may answer, mm -hmm. try to answer that question because one of the things we do, for instance, with, the, with the, uh, the big meetings that we organize on One Health, so we have our flying circus, we call it. Yeah? So we have our, our peers coming together, talking to each other on an a, an a biannual basis. That's fantastic because we're exchanging all the information similar to what we're doing here. But we, we also always do also have a separate track yeah, where, we, where we invite policymakers at the highest level. And the funny thing is if you, if you bring together scientists of high quality and you bring policymakers on board, if you really want to change the world, and even questions that mm -hmm. we are discussing here today about BSL-4 labs, et cetera, yeah, and how to share things, et cetera, this is at the end of the day, it's the policymakers, the politicians, yeah, that are going to, to make the difference at the end of the day. So, and then normally what we are discussing is not being understood for them, so what we do is we have, and that might be a suggestion for these meetings as well, have a separate track where we have, at our meetings, when we have 1,000 people together, we make always sure that we have 200 policymakers of the highest levels, yeah, being DGs and the direct cabinets and the like, and we call that the governments group, and th there we have very intensive discussions, and even questions in the European Parliament are being asked, etc. So you're really steering policy there, and I think it's a missed opportunity to bring all this intellectual power here together and not feed that into those guys who really need that, because if you look at how policy is being made these days, not only in the US, it's, it's worldwide. If you see how policy is being made, yeah, without all the input of the, the, the top experts, I think it is a missed opportunity. So that might be something we might consider. We'll do it anyway at our meetings and in the, the meeting that we're going to organize in Edinburgh, we already have that circus there. So that basically, and we are being asked by policymakers from of that level, actually between our meetings to organize extra meetings to invite experts to do exactly the same thing. So uh, that is a bit of an opportunity that we are missing here. And my suggestion to GBN from that point of view is why not try and set up a similar circus? But this is a very important point. And to go on this, you see, we, ha this is, uh, we have to increase the visibility of the GBN. Because, for example, for this meeting, we really try to initiate exactly what you are referring to. And we have to be very realistic. Uh, we were welcome with... Uh, lot of interest and so on, but because those people have many uh, meetings, uh, complicated agendas, at the end of the day we had a difficulty, which is not necessarily a problem, but you see, to, to organize this uh, for, for today. But I really take your point. Uh, 
we are increasing visibility. We have something with WHO, other institutions. And then, <coughs> yes, we need to do exactly what we have emphasized for the, uh, for the uh, One Health uh, uh, meetings. So I, I really take this point. And to your point, it's, it's exactly also what we want to get from, uh, from, this missing b from these meetings beside science, which are our unique assets. And you have given some uh, uh, good keywords, I believe. <coughs> and this is what we will engage with you in the following months. Uh, for example, we know that we have, to we have to be very open. We have to very much improve our website. We have to provide a much stronger and clear, and no it's not a criticism for the teams. It's just we need to have a clear statement on why we are unique, what can we bring, which are our connection to the political, uh, uh, the political side, say. Uh, so uh, really, I, I take this point. <coughs> thank you. Yeah, so we have uh, two questions. No yes, one sec. Yes. yes, thank you. And um, then you. What are we looking at in terms of the pathogens themselves? Um, do we know, uh, do th does it vary in terms of engineering or having a man-induced pathogen that one person could actually do it or it takes a group a whole lot more expertise? Is, is, it, is it looked at all like that? Well, I would say that uh, our strength is to have the expertise on all viruses. And what this meeting does demonstrate is that it's the interesting uh, exchange of experience between viruses which are very different, which would be provide the, the answer. But um, some are going to definitely be more easily engineered, correct? Yeah. yeah. But well, there's a lot of technologies ongoing yeah. which are more universal. So platform technologies, you were <coughs> talking about that, yeah, for the antibodies, yeah. but also for vaccine development. So CEPI is doing that, is in investing. There's some European yeah. projects that are doing that. So I think that that point is is, is 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 being addressed more and more. And I think it's an important point for the group here as well. Yeah, Aaron, you know. Yes, uh, I just want to pick it up from uh, what Ab has said in uh, in terms of uh, policymakers. Uh, in order to increase uh, uh, visibility, I think we need to buy in uh, the policy model. And the way we can do this is to have formal recognition <coughs> with uh, maybe regional economic communities you have in all these regions, North Africa, Southern Africa, Southeast Asia, and so forth. And then Africa, Africa Union, you have Africa CDC, we need to have formal recognition. We give them our vision, mission, and so forth. So when we talk, sometimes when they have bought in what we do, we don't have to be everywhere. Our eyes, they will be our eyes. They will be our ears. And this will also reduce on the bureaucracy that is involved when we need to respond. <coughs> you remember sometimes processing documents to work on maybe new pathogens. It will take a year. But if we have this, I think it will reduce the timeline. Formal recognition, yes. Thank you. Thank you. And just to go along the same line, I mean, because we have to be, I would say, to, we really want to have concrete actions. For example, I have presented the GVN at several occasions this year uh, during meetings organized by CEPI, during uh, for the Africa CDC, and so on. Okay, this is all very, very good. This is my task and so on. But I believe that this is our task to do so. What I mean is that, for example, Hubert <laughs> started his presentation with a presentation of the Fondation Merieux. And he said, well, I start with <laughs> showing what is the Fondation Merieux. And then he started his talk. Several people here started by saying, well, this is what I'm doing. And now I, 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 I take my, uh, my topic. Well, I would submit but if we want to really, really get visible, because you have such a, a diversity, I really take the point of expertise, that you have also, uh, I would say, to be with us, the ambassadors of GVN. Uh, means also that when you have a paper which is being published, uh, you might consider to refer as GVN. You see, I'm not telling that this is this which will solve, we, we are talking of much larger questions, but I'm really taking this opportunity. Uh, 
to uh, emphasize that visibility, which is necessary for the contact with policy makers, with institutions, does not only come from the top of an institution. And this has been always my experience. It's a community effort. And we will see in one year where we stand. <laughs> We might also consider inviting some of the journal editors and more of the funding agencies yeah. as well, too, because these people yeah. know they read everything and they know everything that's happening and they have that 30,000 foot view of the different science of virology. Mm -hmm. And if some of these journal editors could invite you know, a page or two commentaries in the front material, that would also increase our exposure. Mm -hmm. I think that's an excellent idea, yeah. and especially if you invite the funders, like, like the CEPIs and, and the, the Bill and Melinda NIH. Gates and NIH, whatever, you know, European Institute, because that, that is very profitable for the people present here as well. Because if, if you get a project yeah, that is w under the flag of GVN, whatever, yeah, and then you get extra money for your own research. And, then and so that would give, we discussed it before also, because, because GVN, one of, the, one of the issues is that money needs to be generated for all kinds of activities, but also for projects. And yeah. not necessarily uh, GVN should be the umbrella all the time. GVN could also be <coughs> uh, partnering in those in those things. And if you, as as you suggested, Christian, if you're writing a project proposal for for Europe, for Bill and Melinda Gates, what have you, yeah, and then using that aff affiliation or have in the European project, for instance, additional partners. Yeah, we are now discussing, for instance, a cost proposal. Mm -hmm. Additional partners, yeah, yeah, like like the like the GVN. That's very well appreciated. So I think think a little bit broader, and you will benefit from it for your own work as well. So it's not it's not an altruistic thing; it's really an egoistic thing. Yeah. So if you do that, yeah, you improve your chances for for having success, and uh, that's that should be appealing to all of us. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. So maybe we will have the conclusive yeah. remarks. Uh, no, but I don't want to. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I just wanted to uh, tell a, a little story. It'll be very brief, but. You know, during the West African outbreak, um, one of the things that our laboratory does is test products that are uh, useful. And we were asked by NIH, our primary funder, does the VSV vaccine work against the strain from West Africa? And that goes right to the question of ownership of, the of these issues. How do you get it? How do you get it into the laboratory? How do you do the experiment in a timely manner? so that the results can be used in the case of West Africa. And, you know, all of the, the challenges that we've talked about here fall into this very practical issue of, okay, we have an emergency of something very serious of global importance. How are we going to be, we collectively going to respond to this? A kind of scenario. Yeah. Huh? Yeah. 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 Yeah, exactly. Well, thank you, thank you. Oh, sorry. Oh, so yeah, I would just yeah. sorry, say sorry. That, that this type of a scenario has to some extent been done <coughs> with the CIRS centers uh, of flow. So I'm director of one of the CIRS centers, centers of excellence in influenza research and surveillance. These are limited to the mm. United States because they are NIID funded, but we have established a framework between all of ourselves, how we're gonna share samples and how we're gonna get samples and get it all import friendly in the case that there is a flu pandemic or a new uh, um, avian influenza virus that is causing problems and sharing immediately all these samples between us and having a specific task that they are assigned to each one. So I think that this can be done. It needs to be done most likely in on a disease by disease basis and also in a known diseases, but it requires a lot of coordination and a lot of first talking and getting ready having all the paperwork that is necessary, ready for sharing samples at the moment that this happens. If not, it takes a long time to get the samples. Yeah, well, thank you very much. That's clearly uh, very useful. We will have the last question with Richard. Richard Sherman.
No, but these are very good points also because that is part of our our future. Our, our future. Okay, well, thank you very much to f the four of you for this, uh, and we will move to the next uh, next session. So thank you very much.